I do everything. <laughs> and I do host like every single event that I'm on. So usually Usually when we're done with each project, uh, someone writes like a kudos email to give like kudos to people who did a good job. And so someone like Hi, everyone. Oh, let me do my video so I can see you all. Thanks for joining us. Uh, give us a minute to welcome everyone. We just finished our advocacy and training seminar. So we're trying to gather our thoughts <laughs> to start this meeting. Hold on. Welcome, welcome, welcome. I am Huri Gedelekian. I am the chair of NGO CSW still <laughs> since last month. It hasn't changed. Thank you all for being here. Hello. Yes, I see. Please mute yourselves. Please, please, please. I'm sorry. We will give you a chance to unmute and speak later. We are expecting, of course, as usual, hundreds of participants. And unfortunately, we can't open up the mic for everyone. I wish we could. I'd love to hear all your voices. We'll do that later. Mute yourselves, get comfortable. We're in for an amazing program later. I am so excited that I will be an observer. Um, our executive committee members, Azadea Khalili and Margarita Jones organized this event and Azi will be moderating. So you're all in for a treat. That's all I'm gonna tell you. Of course, I do have a lot of updates for you, but I'm kind of killing time, as you can see here a little bit, as people are coming in and settling in. I hope you're all doing well. Um, let's see. 
Of course, as you know, I always like to have like a moment of centeredness. Perhaps we can do that as we're admitting people. Uh, we just ask for your patience. If you have not heard from us, I think by next week, we should be able to catch up with everything and then maybe concentrate a little bit on some fun things like organizing our consultation day. So um, here's our updates. The platform is up and ready and going. We are also just like you learning as much as we can as we go along. This is a huge endeavor for us. Uh, we've never done anything at this scale and virtually. Um, we're happy with the choices we've made with the platform, but again, it is still something completely new. So we are learning as we go along. We have over 5,000 registrants right now, advocates, speakers, all, all kinds of, um, and we are heading to our next um, level to up to 10,000 participants. And you can imagine um, how nerve wracking that is to see, and hopefully, you know, the platform will not collapse and that we will all get to enjoy it um, as best we can. I'm not a techie person. It took me a while to get used to it, but I want to assure you all that all it needs is a little bit of playing around and it's not that difficult. It's just at first, just like, I don't know, some of you could be like me when I have to press something and sign up for something, it gets really scary. But we're very excited for this. We are also organizing some really um, important um, co-sponsored events that I would like to highlight for all of you to explore and see. Um, we have an exhibit, exhibit booth for NGO CSW where you will find many of our conversation circles. We've scheduled 10 of them with different topics. They're all listed in there. We are also in the process of scheduling caucuses. There's going to be at least hopefully two caucuses per region. Um, if you don't see your region's caucus scheduled yet, it just means we're waiting for our sisters in those regions uh, we are waiting for them to confirm their time and date so that we can schedule them. We also made an agreement with UN Women who accepted to host their own exhibit booth. And if you go on the um, platform, you will see what I mean. There's a drop down. You can see the exhibit booth drop down. And then when you go there, you'll see quite a few of you actually applied to have your own exhibit booths. It is $1,000 because it's, it takes a lot to manage these booths. So it's not available for so many small organizations, unfortunately, but you have other opportunities, which I'll explain on how to network on the platform. So one of those exhibit booths is going to be by UN Women where you can go in and um, leave messages, communicate with them and get information. So they've promised to update uh, their information regularly and engage with you as much as possible. So I'm very, very proud and happy to announce that. We are still working with member states. One of our goals, if you've been with us for the last few months, I've been saying, and we've been negotiating with member states, starting with the uh, bureau chair to see if we can bring them to our platform as well, because we realize how, how difficult it is this year to engage with member states. We're not gonna have an opportunity to walk around the hallways and see them at Vienna Cafe. So we're in conversations with member states and with the help of UN Women, to figure out even maybe creating something called Vienna Cafe. If for, for those of you who have, have been to New York City during CSW, you know what I'm talking about. So that's still in the works. I know we're only four weeks away and we should have all of these planned, but we're working as diligently and as fast as we can. And this is how far we've come so far. So we're hoping, we're, we're still working on that. Um, at the same time, there's a lot of updates from UN Women that I will share with you. They have about 3,800 applicants on the ECOSOC level. And just to explain again, the, what we organize is actually the NGO CSW side, which includes and accepts 
all NGOs. You don't have to be ECOSOC accredited to be on the NGO CSW platform. You're all welcome there and you're all welcome to navigate network and and leave messages and recommendations on what you want to see in CSW. Um, for the high level UN women side CSW proper, if you want to call it that, you have to be ECOSOC accredited. So for that ECOSOC accredited organizations, the, the application is still open until the 21st. I'll leave you the link in a minute. Um, and like I said, UN Women said that 3,800 people have already applied. Um, and they're saying that before it closes, they're reminding that um, point people on organizations should approve their applicants as soon as possible so that it can um, be finalized. The concept note for interactive dialogue are available online. And I am going to share this link. Hold on, who's messaging me? Hold on, hold on, I need to get everybody, everyone in meeting. Here's the link. Thank you, Ivy, <laughs> for this, this link. If you scroll down, you'll see the um, information on the interactive dialogue. Um, and they are also now finalizing the calendar of side events. Like I said, we have parallel events and CSW proper on UN Women's side, it's called side events. They will all be virtual this year and hopefully all available online for us to participate in. It all depends on who's organizing it, if they're going to make it open or not. Apparently, UN Women has re received up to 100 side events organized by members, member states and UN entities, and that will be added on their site by next week. Um, so if you have any questions, I know that there are people here in the room with me, Ivy, Devin can answer in the chat, but um, let's see what else I can update. Oh, the other thing I wanted to really mention to you quickly is about GEF, um, Generation Equality Forum. They opened up their um, public conversations recently, and I really encourage all of you, if you don't know about GEF and this is new to you, here's their website and how to find out more about GEF. And then I will share with you the public conversation link, which I had ready right here, and now it's not. <laughs> I'll find it in a minute. Um, but that's, that's all I have as far as GEF is concerned. Um, but the public conversations, like I said, I really would want you all to engage in. Ah, where is it? It was just here. <laughs> okay, so in the meantime, I hope you are following all of our activities, especially with the YLYP. They have been so busy uh, organizing some really important um, events, including training and advocacy, which we just finished, and also presentation skills. Um, and I always like to remind people that even though this is, it says YLYP, and it is organized by them, there's no age limit. You know, if you're new to this and you want to learn more, uh, we encourage you to definitely participate and learn whatever you can and engage. And here's the public conversation. Sorry, I'm multitasking here. <laughs> okay. So let's see. Um, I have my notes. Um, I think I covered it all. I probably spoke way too fast. So I will pause and see if there's any questions that I need to answer. Oh, oh, th yes, there is one more. Our advocacy and research committee um, has been doing an amazing job and they're almost done. 
to release their recommendations. I'm very proud of this uh, committee co-chaired by Susan O'Malley, as you all know, she was my predecessor, uh, recent past chair, and also Erica Higby. They've been meeting weekly with our global advocates and diligently accepting recommendations. And the document should be available by Monday. Um, and then you can use that in your advocacy with your member states. And please do pay attention. We will release our advocacy and training seminar that we just finished. We'll release it in the next day or two. If you were not there, it was so good and so successful. I want you to take the time to listen to it and, and see how you can advocate in these strange times. Like I said, when we can't really meet with member states, we are recommending most of you to go at your local level if possible, um, speak to your national representatives, um, and also, you know, influence from like bottom up instead of just at the UN level where we're not going to be able to see them. Um, yes, another one I wanted to remind you, as I said, the parallel events are being scheduled. I know, like, like I said, we're getting a lot of questions and emails on parallel events. It's not as complicated as it seems, but there's going to be another email going out, hopefully this afternoon or maybe tomorrow morning, the latest where it will give you clear instructions on how to access your parallel event. Um, so that, you know, we're not forgetting this. I know some of you might be anxious, but we're doing the best we can to answer your questions and, uh, and, and also to give you instructions as much as possible. Um, so let's see. And I think, wait, is it possible that's it? Um, somebody's asking about program, apply for the program. If you mean the platform, I can definitely, and I'm sure somebody already put that link, but I'll put it again. The platform is still open for everyone to join. And here it is to join the platform. Um, and Bethan says the recording, that was the advocacy and training that we just did. And we will share that with you in a couple of days. Oops, sorry. All right. Any other questions? Your parallel events are accessible for you to manage, to change speaker names. Um, and maybe perhaps, I don't know, Devin, are you available to talk us to talk to us a little bit about, I know you have all the answers much better than me, but where we're at with parallel events and the email that you're sending out for with more instructions. Um, would you like to take the mic and let everybody know about sure. what's going on? Thank you, my dear. Um, so we have a lot of the parallel events scheduled, um, most of them scheduled. Um, I'm gonna be sending out an email with more information, um, some important information for, for parallel event organizers. So you should get that in the next couple of days. Um, I see there's a question here about designing your event, adding pictures and speakers. We have a change request form for all of that. So if you have any um, changes to your parallel event, please submit it there. I'll send the link in the chat. Um, yeah, I think I think that's it. Um, just keep a lookout for that email that we're going to send. Um, yeah. So yes, we are feeling very confident that we are catching up with all of this. It's been quite a hectic couple of weeks to say the least, but I am seriously joining this meeting with a lot more confidence than I had a few days ago, uh, knowing the amount of demand that we were getting, not just with participation, but with the parallel events and also not getting a lot of support from member states was frustrating. We have a lot of partners who are helping us with that. 
Um, of course, we are in touch with the chair of uh, the Bureau who's listening to our recommendations and is trying his best to include civil society voices. Unfortunately, UN in general is still uh, run by 193 countries and there are still some countries who are not willing to include civil society as much as we would like to be included. But the, the goal is, and that's what our advocacy and training was all about, the goal is for us to always find different ways of managing that, right? So I've, I've said this so many times, if they close the door, we'll find a way to come in the window. But you know, we're, we're doing the best with that. Um, let's see, is there anything else that I am missing here from the chat? And thank you, Ivy and Devin, for answering a lot of the questions. All right. So I will be around throughout the program, even though I'm really going to try to pay attention and participate in the program, which I'm so excited and looking forward to learning. I will be around to answer as many questions as possible as you think of them. But I want to hand over the mic to our communications secretary, the one and only Azadeh Lili, to take over and run us through the program. Thank you, Azi, for the amazing work you did organizing this. The floor is yours. Thank you, Huri. Can you hear me? Absolutely. You've got the floor. Hello, everyone. Um, I want to welcome um, all the participants from around the globe. It's very exciting that there are over um, um, 230 of us uh, at this meeting today. Uh, first, I want to uh, thank my uh, co-organizer, Margarita Jones, and also thank Devin, Olivia, and Kayla for doing all the work behind the scenes for making today's um, monthly meeting possible. So today's topic is uh, climate crisis and climate action by and for women and girls. And as you know, the climate crisis presents an unprecedented threat to economies and communities all around the globe. Um, we have been witnessing disasters all everywhere. Um, while the climate crisis burdens all of us, all of humanity, it doesn't burden us equally. The world's poor, folks in poverty, the majority of whom are women and girls, are disproportionately affected by the terrible consequences of climate crisis. The majority of people know climate crisis is a problem. Uh, the people of the world know this and want to allocate more and more resources to address this crisis. Uh, in the US, for example, two thirds of the people surveyed recently called the situation a climate emergency. The climate emergency is a problem that humans have created. So it must be a problem we humans can actually solve. As Greta Thunberg uh, likes to say, the good news is that uh, the climate crisis is already solved. We even know what to do to solve this huge problem. We really do, we really do. Even um, everyday solutions are uh, created by frontline communities. So we have the solutions. The policies are known to governments of the world. We have enough technologies. We know what to do. Victory is within our reach. We can create workable and equitable solutions on the local, national, and global level. And to do that, uh, women and girls must be in the forefront of those changes. Women must continue to serve as agents of these necessary changes. Women must continue to act as agents of mitigation, adaptation, and prevention of the most serious consequences of climate crisis. As soon as governments at all levels become more responsive and inclusive of women's voices, um, I just got a message that our, um, 
that folks are here. So as I was saying, as soon as governments at all levels become more responsive and inclusive of women's voices and leadership, we will start to see uh, more and more rapid progress. In the US, the Climate Denial Administration was ousted and new administration is taking many more actions on the climate emergency. The situation from my perspective is very, it looks very hopeful. Uh, we are seeing fewer and fewer fossil fuel subsidies. In the US, we have a Native American woman as Secretary of in, uh, Interior addressing uh, racial justice and more. We are seeing big investments in clean energy and green jobs, no more drilling for oil on federal lands. We are seeing new opportunities for climate funding. And we are fighting for a green recovery, not just a green new deal, but also a feminist green new deal. And our uh, speakers today will actually address why a feminist green new deal as well. We often focus on the problem of climate change and there are many, but the reality is that climate uh, movement has never been stronger. The large number of young people and women coming into the climate movement, those who have been in the forefront of the climate uh, justice bring intelligence and strength into the movement. We have two incredible speakers today who represent that. They will, share, they will share their thinking with us about the international and the US situation and talk about examples of the solution that have proven to be successful. Um, our first speaker, um, I want to see it um, since. Um, our first speaker since Osprey Oreo Lake has joined us. I would like her to go first. She is the co-director of the Women's Earth and Climate Action Network International. Osprey is the founder and executive director of We Can. She has been working nationally and internationally with frontline grassroots and indigenous uh, leaders, policymakers. And, di and building diverse coalitions, uh, bringing in women's leadership, climate justice, uh, movement activists. And uh, she's, uh, uh, she has done, she, she has, she will speak more to the work that she has done, but um, I have had the good fortune of reading some of her writings about climate justice, women in leadership and other topics. Um, uh, you can find some of her writings in The Guardian, in Common Dreams, Earth Island Journal, The Ecologist, Open Democracy, and Echo Watch. And um, you can also read her books, uh, her book uh, titled uh, Uprisings for the Earth, uh, Reconnecting Culture and Nature, which won the 2011 Nautilus Book Award. So uh, without further ado, let's, uh, let's um, speak with Os Osprey. Hello, everyone. Hello, welcome. It's wonderful to, to have you with us. Thank you, thank you. Um, uh, again, um, I, I, I would love to um, have you tell us more about the work that you do and tell us more about WeCan. You're the founder of the organization, tell us why we can't, why the mission of your organization. Yeah, and I, I, I jumped on not at the beginning of the call, but heard a little bit of what you had to say. And it's very much in alignment with, with what you're talking about, you know, that it's really internationally recognized that women are critical to implementing solutions to the climate crisis, and yet women need more prominent spaces and mechanisms to really marshal our united efforts and involvement into a clear and defined movement. And that's really how uh, the Women's Earth and Climate Action Network was generated, was just understanding, you know, um, that we needed an intersectional analysis and that, you know, women are on the front lines, um, but they also need to be at the forefront of the movement because um, we are disproportionately impacted by the climate crisis and environmental degradation. Um, and yet we're simultaneously by the leaders in local and global solutions. And I won't go into a lot of the statistics, um, but I would just suggest if, um, 
if uh, you are all interested in learning more about exactly why women are at the forefront uh, on our web page um, and on, on our website, there's um, a section called Why Women? And there's just a plethora of information about, you know, how women are leading, why they're leading, and, and why this is so crucial to, to lift up um, women's engagement um, and feminists across the gender spectrum, really worldwide in policy advocacy, on the ground projects, direct actions, trainings, and movement building for global climate justice. And that's that's really, you know, the work that we do. And I would just also just say that, you know, for um, long lasting change, because we really need to have short term and long term solutions, it's essential that we transform the dominant social structures that really lie at the root of gender inequality as well as the destruction of the earth because those two things are very interconnected so we have to look at systemic change and challenge old paradigms of patriarchy white supremacy colonization imperialism and capitalism which are again interlocking problems and we find that um, the women that we work with around the world are really connecting those dots and they're willing and able to unite across borders to challenge systems of oppression uh, to build a healthy and livable future. And so this is really sort of the core of our work at WeCan. Hello? Hi, I do. thank you for that. And here at the NGO CSW, we have been having a lot of conversations about uh, really um, taking on root causes of oppression and taking on systemic oppression um, and really thinking about um, racism and sexism and imperialism and also taking on it about, of course, class oppression and capitalism. Uh, Osper, can you talk to us about some of the campaigns that you've taken on in the last period? Sure. Um, we have a variety of programs. Um, as I was mentioning, you know, we do a lot of work around uh, policy advocacy. We do direct actions. We do trainings. So there's there's a host of things. So I'll just mention a few. Um, as an example, we have a we've been very honored to co-direct the Indigenous Women's Divestment Delegations, which was founded by Michelle Cook. She's a really wonderful wonderful Navajo human rights lawyer. And um, the central goal of the delegations is to provide a platform for indigenous women leaders to meet face to face. And, and now obviously in the pandemic, virtually um, representing you know, their communities and to meet face to face with European and US banks, insurance companies and asset managers to expose injustices and directly share with these entities exactly how their fossil fuel financing their, um, how they're engaged with companies who are extracting violates human indigenous rights um, while also driving further climate disruptions. And you know, I'm really glad to say that these delegations have borne really critical results in gaining divestments, um, educating financial institutions, um, pushing forward policy changes within financial institutions and investigations. Um, including removing you know hundreds of thousands hundreds of millions rather of dollars off the table you know there's a lot more work to do but i i think this divestment work is really key and and for um people in these institutions to really hear how their uh the companies that they're financing are really impacting people on the ground and creating you know truly life and death situations um and especially this is impacting you know women and girls primarily in, in the extractive industries. Um, and uh, we're really excited that uh, last year we had been sort of doing small versions of this, but we've launched a full on food sovereignty and security program. Um, and right now we're working with indigenous women who are leading um, this program in uh, the Gulf South right now. And this is to really secure uh, food uh, for people often who live in um, food deserts, um, also uh, medical deserts where they really need to be growing their own medicinal herbs, uh, getting on a path of creating food sovereignty on their own as, as we know the climate crisis will continue to increase. So that's been really exciting. Um, we have a, a, a very core program around women for forests and we work in um, the Tonkas rainforest in Alaska 
uh, with Tlingit women. And um, that's been very important because during the Trump administration, there was really an attack on the Tongass rainforest. And here in the United States, um, it is um, a forest that many people don't know about, but it sequesters about 10% of all of our carbon emissions from um, uh, 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 it, uh, carbon emissions uh, for forests across the country. So it's really important. And also, of course, for indigenous people and their traditional way of life, we really need to protect this forest. So we're involved in a lawsuit right now um, to protect the forest and doing a lot of campaigning around that. We work in the Amazon rainforest, particularly in Ecuador and Brazil, very focused again on forest protection and supporting land defenders, women land defenders for protecting their territories from fossil fuel extraction. And then we have a reforestation program in the Democratic Republic of Congo, which is also really exciting. We've been reforesting there for about five years, this whole whole region. Um, and then um, I think I, when I jumped on the call, you were talking about the um, Feminist Coalition for Green New Deal. Um, and this is work that we do in coalition with other wonderful groups in the United States. Um, but even though it's US based, we really understand that um, you know, we, we have to have a program that recognizes the global implications of the US climate action or inaction. And so um, the, the coalition is very focused on not only US policy, but how that relates to um, international climate policies. Um, and we've been participating in collective dialogues and workshops promoting the tenets of the Feminist Green New Deal. And um, everyone's welcome to join and, and check that out online. Um, Creating, we're creating policy tools and you know, bringing forward a feminist analysis to uh, the climate talks um, in, uh, you know, at the United Nations every year, but also here in the United States. Um, and I think one of the focuses that I'm really excited about is the need uh, for um, further research and publication, uh, public education on fem feminist economies and what is a care economy and why is that so important to the um, conversation on climate and, and a new analysis on climate. That's great, thank you, that was great. Can we go back, you, you have made references to how um, women and girls have been affected, but I, I wanna ask you the question straight up, um, how is the climate crisis affecting indigenous women and girls? Um, and I know there are indigenous women from all around the globe on this call and, and uh, we're all always trying to learn more. So give us more information, that's great. Sure, um, I mean, I, I just have, you know, so much respect for the indigenous women and indigenous youth that we work with um, in, in different countries. And just to contextualize, you know, 80% of the remaining biodiversity remaining on earth is in the hands of indigenous peoples. Uh, so to accurately reflect real solutions to the climate crisis, indigenous sovereignty and solutions are really paramount. Um, there's a great deal of research showing that when indigenous rights and sovereignty are secured, the land, the water, the forest really flourish. Um, and indigenous women and their communities um, really must not only have a seat at the table, but also need to be leading the conversations around land protection climate solutions and, and how that connects to indigenous rights. Um, and here in the United States, as well as in many countries, we need to have really explicit legislation that respects the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. And, you know, you're asking specifically about focusing on indigenous women and girls. There's, you know, they're frequently the backbone of their communities. Um, they're knowledge keepers of biodiversity and forests and leaders in resistance efforts to defend their lands. And I think there's just so much we can learn from indigenous women about how to live in respect of the natural laws of the earth through vital traditional ecological knowledge that they carry. Um, so I just think that, that their work could not be more uh, important as we face climate chaos, environmental degradation, the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, and, um, you know, I also have learned so much from them about uh, their knowledge of economic systems that are not based on capitalism, such as Gwen Bevere coming from communities in the global south, which are you know, really profound concepts um, having to do with deep cosmological as well as cultural, economic, and political worldviews about how we can live in harmony with communities, ourselves, and nature. 
Um, but having said all this, you know, I think what's really tragic is that there are many threats to indigenous women and girls um, and how they experience racism, colonial policies and patriarchy. You know, as an example, um, across Latin American, um, you know, women land defenders are often under attack. They're persecuted, criminalized and experience violence. Um, and I think the international community became more aware of this situation in 2016 after the assassination of the beloved Honduran indigenous leader, Betty Caceres, who was murdered for leading a campaign against a major dam on the river in her people's territories. And, you know, that fight goes on and on. Um, in many indigenous communities, sexual violence against women is, is a grave threat perpetuated by polluting fossil fuel and mining industries. Um, and, you know, as one example here in the US, there's something called man camps, which are expansive trailer units, sometimes housing thousands of industry workers in oil and gas drilling regions. And they've resulted in extremely high rates of rape and abuse of um, local indigenous women and girls. Um, you know, right now, uh, we are involved with many other organizations um, doing everything we can to support indigenous women who are leading a big fight right now going on today um, uh, on the tar sands pipeline called line three that is crossing major waterways uh, um, and indigenous people's traditional lands uh, which will destroy their sacred homelands and way of life and we're we're really outraged that enbridge um, which is the company behind the pipeline is pushing this uh pipeline project through in the middle of a pandemic you know and then workers are bringing more disease uh to indigenous communities so it's a, it's a tragic situation that we see, <clears throat> excuse me, repeated, you know, all over the world. And we really know that we need to keep pushing governments, financial institutions and energy companies to uphold and implement processes uh, that respect indigenous rights and the framework of free or informed consent and, and really supporting that tribes have the right to say no. Um, lastly, on this point, because I think it's really important is I wanna bring attention to the Askazu Agreement which uh, some of you might know um, is um, a really powerful uh, new agreement that people have been advocating for, for for over a decade. We've been involved in this fight since 2016. Um, and uh, you know there has really been largely a lack of political will at the national and international levels to implement policies and frameworks that ensure the rights and protection of environmental defenders so yes, we need laws to protect um, the environment, but also hand in hand, we need to protect the land defenders doing that work. So um, I'm very glad to say that uh, this past November in 2020, the Escazu Agreement was fully ratified and can provide really a transformational multilateral agreement for the Latin American Caribbean region, the LAC region. Um, and this agreement guarantees access rights on environmental matters and the explicit protection of human rights and environmental defenders. Um, and as some of you might know, Latin America is one of the deadliest regions for environmental land defenders. Um, in 2019, of those officially recorded, 212 land environmental defenders were murdered uh, with over two thirds of those killings taking place in Latin America. And this deeply affects indigenous peoples um, and, and indigenous women rights defenders and land defenders. So we're really excited about this new opportunity um, and we're, we're organizing around that right now. So I think that's, that's really, um, really inspiring. But again, you know, when we're looking at indigenous women and girls, you know, they have this, this extra threat of um, threats to their bodies, uh, threats to the violence of the land that, that impacts them, both their health, um, their reproductive rights and uh, also their capacity to do the work they need to do because of, of threats um, to to violence and uh, uh, sexual threats as well. Talking with uh, holding government uh, accountable and uh, defending the rights of uh, land defense. I'm sorry, I can't hear you very well. Pardon me. Can you hear me now? Yeah, it was just very difficult to hear. Yeah, yeah I, think, I think your mic should be closer. Sorry. Oh, talking of uh, holding governments accountable for, um, for um, you know, for this, you know, for these agreements and also 
uh, really defending the rights of land keepers. I want to ask you a question about um, how have you uplifted um, frontline grassroots? How can uh, you uplift frontline grassroots indigenous women's presence at the UN. I know you've done a lot of work around building coalitions, but on an international level with the UN, what do you, um, is there any any recommendations you have for the for folks who are um, in this field? Yeah, um, I, I think, you know, I can share share our experiences. Um, you know, we at WeCan um, for since, since our founding, um, in, in 2013, you know, we have been participating both within and outside of the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, the UNFCCC, the Convention of Parties, um, and participating in those con convenings um, and also supporting the women and gender constituency, which is uh, part of the, the way that um, <clears throat> civil society can participate in the process. And we've been there uh, to advocate for climate justice, gender equality, indigenous rights, rights of nature, and meaningful and bold action on climate change. And we've been really honored to be organizing, as you mentioned, these um, you know delegations of frontline grassroots and indigenous women from around the world, um, so that they have the opportunity to speak for themselves within these spaces, such as the UN climate negotiations. Um, um, as well as uh, we've uh, created several opportunities over many years also for Indigenous women to participate um, in the UN Permanent Forum on Indigenous Peoples. And these are all, you know, international spaces, as you say, where it's so important for grassroots, frontline, and Indigenous women to have an opportunity to speak for themselves, to meet with policymakers, to build power together by, by meeting other colleagues. So they can share their demands um, on the ground, sustainability solutions, their resistance movement. Um, you know, in an era of continued oppression, fossil fuel expansion, and false climate solutions, I think the voices of grassroots frontline and indigenous women leaders really couldn't be more important for them to, to have access. So, you know, any way that we can help organize these um, convenings, um, you know, it's a lot of work, you know, just at the practical level of you know, um, you know, the fundraising for travel, uh, organizing the delegations themselves, doing trainings to prepare women to be in advocacy spaces and to speak out. Um, and uh, also, most importantly, following their leadership about what they want to do, what they know they need to do, what they need to speak about, um, and then creating, you know, actual spaces and confirming meetings uh, for them to go ahead and advocate for themselves. Um, you know, and, and that said, we have to remember, you know, out of, you know, we respect these UN spaces because it is an opportunity for the global community to come together. Um, but we also need to remember that there is also agendas happening uh, within that context, driving, um, you know, uh, uh, neoliberal economic models that are destructive to nature and to frontline communities, um, the implementation of market-based mechanisms that often harm people and planet so, you know, it's always uh, a dance to push forward things that are very positive that are happening in these spaces, but also be very critical and um, push forward, um, you know, a, a, against these systems that happen in these international convenings. So there is more gender equality. There is more women's leadership um, uh, and that we really address these racist and colonial systems that continue to silence and ignore indigenous peoples, their rights, their sovereignty, and um, you know, ignore uh, the voice of indigenous people who, as I say, are uh, you know responsible for protecting our water, our land, our forests. Again, 80% of the biodiversity remaining on Earth is in their lands and hands, and there's a reason for that. It's uh, the knowledge base that they're carrying. So we really need to continue to to really uplift um, uh, uplift their voices there and ensure that they have a, a front seat at the table. Thank you. This this is really great. Um, if I may be bold, I want to ask you a personal question. Um, and this is the last question. Um, you are taking on big systems of oppression. You're taking on corporations within the US, outside of the US. You are uplifting the voices of 
uh, very powerful people who should be at the table who are not and bringing them to the table. Uh, wh where do you find hope, Osprey? Tell us, uh, when you wake up in the morning, how do you find the motivation? How do you find hope? Where do you find hope? Well, with the women that are right here that I can see on my screen, that's one place I have hope. The fact of all of you meeting today and the fact that you all want to engage, you already are engaged. I'm sure there's many leaders on this call who could be speaking instead of me with your incredible passionate work. So a big source of my hope is in women all over the world that are doing everything we can and take very seriously that this is a moment where we're talking about uh, the potential for human extinction. Like the reality is we are in a life and death fight. And of course, those on the front lines, uh, uh, women of color, black, indigenous, brown women um, are the ones carrying the first brunt of all of these colliding crises of COVID-19 pandemic, um, the climate crisis, environmental degradation, colonial policies, racism. So, you know, first and foremost, I find my hope in frontline women who have knowledge because they've been experiencing these systems of oppression more than anyone else and longer and have navigated. And so I get a lot of hope from the solutions from the women on the front line as well because um, they know what they're doing and they should be leading. Um, even now, when we look at the COVID-19 pandemic, we see that all over the world, countries led by women have fared the COVID-19 pandemic far better than countries led by men. So my hope comes from uh, all of the women who are rolling up their sleeves and literally doing every single thing they can across borders to stop this insanity that we're in in destroying the earth and, and hurting people. And, um, you know, we will fight every day ceaselessly to protect our beautiful planet and, and so many amazing people. And, and that's where I get, get my inspiration from is hope is, is all the effort being put forth um, to, to change this trajectory. Thank you so much for your time. I know um, you, you were incredibly busy today and you made the time to be with us and um, give us a perspective about your work and talk to us about um, how some of your campaigns and bring hope to, to all our participants. I wanna thank you for being here and uh, we will be in touch. Great, thank you. Have thank a wonderful you. day. Good luck to all of you with your work. Thank you. Okay. Bye-bye. Thank you. This was wonderful. Now I want to, our next speaker is Mara Dolan. Um, and uh, Mara and I uh, got to have been having excellent conversations before, uh, before this program. And uh, she is the program advocacy associate at the Women's Environment and Development Organization, we do. She's an intersectional feminist, environmentalist, and student and freelance journalist. Um, at We Do, Mara works on policy research, advocacy, and coalition building among feminists and climate justice movements. Uh, she graduated uh, with a bachelor's degree from science in environmental justice from Brown University. Her uh, journalistic work focuses on climate justice and women's rights. She's been published in The Nation, The Teen Vogue, and Bitch Media. So thank you very much. I'm very excited that Mara is with us. Uh, um, let's see if we can have her be unmuted. Hello, hello, I'm here. Hello, Mara, welcome. I'm glad thank you're you. with us. Um, so tell us about the mission of We Do and tell us about the work that you, you do. Sure, absolutely. I actually prepared a presentation, if that's useful. I'm a bit of a visual learner. So when I walk through sort of um, big questions and talk about work, I often enjoy when someone has something for me to look at as well. So if that's okay, I'll screen share. Please, go ahead. All right. Here we go. Can you all see this?
Yep. Yes, we can see. Yes, thank you. We can see it. Okay, great. All right. Well, as we wait for this to load, um, thank you for that incredibly kind introduction. Um, so again, my name is Mara. I use she, her pronouns. Um, I work at the Women's Environment and Development Organization. We do for short. Um, and I am really honored as well to have followed Osprey, who is a close colleague and who we do quite a bit of work um, in collective and in coalition with Osprey and we can more generally. Um, the Feminist Green New Deal Coalition uh, really came out of a lot of the a lot of the conversations that folks at WeCan and we do and Madre and many many others in the U.S. were having around the key role that feminist organizations play in ensuring that that responses to the climate crisis um, consider gender and are feminist at their core. So it was great to be here and share space with Osprey and. Um, we do is an organization that uh, is very near and dear to my heart. I'm a young feminist, I'm an intersectional feminist, um, and I'm also a climate justice advocate. So I hope that I can share all of those um, values with you all today as I, as I walk you through some of the work that we do and um, that we do at We Do <laughs> and um, how folks can get involved. So I was asked to, um, or first I'll just, so you know where the where I'm coming from and what my organization sort of sees at, as its mission at its core. We do is, is a global women's advocacy organization that works for a just world um, by promoting and protecting human rights, gender equality, and the integrity of the environment. So you can really see uh, within that description, we work very closely at the intersection of gender, climate justice, um, human rights, indigenous sovereignty, um, and a livable world for all. One of our co-founders, one of our founding mothers, we like to say, um, Bella Abzu, this is a quote that I often return to when I'm thinking about the value of having very radical feminist praxis in this work. Uh, and she taught us that women will not simply be mainstreamed into a polluted stream. Women are changing the stream, making it clean and green and safe for all, every gender, race, creed, sexual orientation, age, and ability. Um, and I, I hold these words often um, when I'm feeling low. So I was asked to also give a brief overview um, as to what sort of the very broad connections between gender, um, women's rights and climate change are. So I think we, we often get this question as advocates who work at this intersection. Um, folks who are new to this space often ask, what does gender have to do with the climate crisis? This is about this huge global phenomenon of greenhouse gases and environmental change. What does this have to do with um, human beings and how, how uh, gender shows up in the world. And the answer is everything. It has everything to do with power, rights, um, and the ability to have clean air and clean water and a livable future for all. So a few of the buckets that I think it's useful to sort of point folks to as they explore what some of the existing research and data and stats are around. And I would add that similar to Osprey's incredible page at um, weekend's website where there's a lot of gathered information. We do also shares a lot of research around specific um, lines of inquiry. So if there are specific questions around food sovereignty or um, sexual health and reproductive rights and how those intersect with climate, we'll often do particular research pieces that provide a lot of the necessary data. So feel free to please go to WeDo's website if you have specific um, areas you're interested in learning more about. But sort of broadly, I think it's really helpful to think about the ways that um, food and crop failures um, are a space in which gender and climate intersect because women tend to experience um, and perform most agricultural work around the world. Um, and they tend to also have uh, the household food production burden. So they tend to be making most of the food. Um, similarly, water scarcity impacts women disproportionately because there's an increased burden on women walking further distances to access safe water. Um, natural disasters, women actually tend to have higher incidence of, of death in natural disasters. Um, and there also tends to be increased threats of violence in all of its forms. Um, fuel shortages and the ways in which um, 
many women's lives um, are, are also really dependent on what kind of time and energy and money does it take to gather the necessary fuel to perform um, whatever you may need to do during your day. So fuel shortages tend to impact women disproportionately as well. Um, and additionally, disease, displacement, and conflict are all spaces in which we see the climate crisis and the ways that natural disasters and water scarcity and crop failure um, and resource distribution all tend to impact women disproportionately because again, the climate crisis is not separate from the many social systems that are built around the ways that um, oppression exists um, along the lines of gender, race, class, and more. So here's another visual that I think is helpful if you're interested in sort of understanding the buckets in which um, some, some ways in which gender and climate are related. Um, many of these overlap, so I'm not going to go into too much detail, but I'm happy to share this afterward. Um, so where, where does we do see our role? What, what are we doing to address this, um, this intersection? So we know that our role, um, really in this space revolves around a couple goals. So one, we want to really ensure and work towards um, women being empowered to claim their rights as decision makers, advocates, and leaders, especially on issues related to environment and sustainable development. And we do that through a variety of ways that I'll get into in a moment. And our second goal is really that sustainable development policies, plans, and practices are gender responsive, they are environmentally and socially just, and they are effectively implemented. So these are two of the buckets of work and our goals that I'll speak to you from we do today. So first, in terms of really building leadership and, and knowing that women, um, women can come into space and um, really really be the environmental leaders and the climate leaders that we need. Part of that is really about learning the language of the processes. So you all know as folks who do work um, at the UN that there are particular ways that inaccessibility shows up in the UN space and in which um, it, is, it is not an ideal space for all to have their voices heard and for all, particularly the folks who have the solutions and who are at the forefront of the crisis, um, for them to be in decision-making positions. So what are the ways that we can effectively build capacity, bring folks to negotiations, ensure that the right people are in the room, grassroots leaders, grassroots feminists are in the room in order to, to make sure that climate policy, policy around women's rights um, actually speaks to these intersections. So a second bucket that we know is really critical for this piece as well is doing the research of, of really generating that intersectional knowledge at the intersection of climate and gender that is so key. So we often um, get questions from governments and from other advocates around what are the exact ways that climate change impacts food security? What are the specific ways that migration and climate change and gender are, are related? And each of these pieces um, could be, could be generating a whole host of, of knowledge centers. And I think it's also key to really point out here that we do um, at its core sees part of this as, as recognizing that grassroots women and grassroots feminists often have the solutions and the knowledge here. Um, and it's not necessarily reaching governments or think tanks um, or the folks who value only a specific kind of knowledge, which tends to be um, gate kept by academia. So what are the ways that we can really honor and, and lift up um, traditional knowledge and lived experience about how gender and climate are interrelated um, in order to influence these big UN policy spaces where policy is being made that affects people's lives. Um, and along those lines, really, how do we take those materials then and advocate and influence? So um, a really useful uh, tool that might be uh, interesting for you all to explore is an app that we do developed um, in partnership with others called the Gender and Climate Tracker. You can go to the App Store and download it now. It's also on our website. Um, and it essentially tracks women's participation and women's leadership at the climate negotiations. So women are, are vastly underrepresented at the climate negotiations, particularly in positions of leadership. But across delegations, there um, are not 
women are not represented as they should be um, and and women and all their gender diversity are not represented as they should be so this tracker actually is putting some data to that and saying this is the growth we have seen over the last few years um, we are seeing these delegations take steps to increase their gender diversity but these delegations are not um, so that's an incredibly useful tool as well to to look at um, for stats so I think it's really key to also ask what are sort of the the ways that these goals and these strategies help align to to really lift up um, feminist solutions to the climate crisis and we know that really it's it's to hold governments accountable to the agreed commitments that they have already made in the paris agreement and in other spaces around human rights women's rights and the environment it's to push for progress and support um, for a more comprehensive and rights-based approach to climate policy um, we always need a watchdog, making sure that policies are not exacerbating inequalities when no one is looking um, to create a more just world and to really understand where power is and where people's movements um, and feminist movements can have uh, real influence and challenge power. So some of these spaces Osprey actually already mentioned. So the women and gender constituency, which um, Bridget Burns, who's the director of We Do, is, is the co-focal point. Um, alongside Davile um, Makoena from Gender CC in South Africa. So those two incredible women leaders um, help coordinate the Women and Gender Constituency, which is a broad coalition of women's rights and feminist activists at the UN climate space. So if you're interested in really learning how um, and participating in advocacy at the UN climate space, would definitely recommend that you join the Women and Gender Constituency. There's lots of ways to get involved there. Similarly, the Women's Major Group does this work at the High Level Political Forum um, and gathers women's rights and feminist activists around um, the Sustainable Development Goals and advocacy. Um, this is more information on the WGC. Uh, some of the key demands at at COP that the WGC holds and really gathers around can also be found on the website, womengenderclimate.org. Um, and the Women Delegates Fund is another programmatic area that we do really knows is key to lifting up um, women leaders and feminist leaders within uh, these spaces in which, just, again, decisions are being made that really affect women's lives. Um, and so the Women Delegates Fund is a capacity building and training program in which uh, grassroots women are brought to um, to the COP space, um, the United Nations climate space, um, and are really key in, in bringing forth a message around women's rights and climate justice um, and ensuring that, that those values are heard in that space. The Green Climate Fund um, is the largest public climate fund and it's a space in which countries are committed to putting resources into in order to fund adaptation projects and mitigation projects. Um, we can see there as one area that we do focuses on huge discrepancies in how women uh, are represented in those meetings and also then how um, gender sensitive and women driven projects are or are not funded. Um, so women are, are far less represented even in these meetings. Um, and we also know that women's rights and uh, women led projects are not being funded the way that they need to be in order to really drive climate solutions. Um, so we do has a whole programmatic area around making sure that gender advocacy is a part of the GCF um, and that there are feminist voices in the room. Uh, and I think similarly to how Osprey was was describing um, the, the really key moment that this is holding as well uh, for women's rights organizations to be building inside and outside power. So the GCF is a space that is not fundamentally feminist, but it's also key that resources are being distributed in a way that is supporting feminist groups. So what are the ways that we can advocate within the GCF to make sure that um, more funding is being directed towards feminist groups, uh, but also what are the ways that movements can push more broadly around um, what needs to happen? outside of the GCF as well. Additionally, we do a lot of work um, within the movement. So we host a lot of webinars and teach-ins and movement education around um, how to be involved in, for example, climate finance advocacy. Um, these are all on WeDo's page and on our, on our YouTube channel as well. Um, WeDo really knows that um, our most powerful change comes from broad 
and powerful movements. Um, and so that's really core to our to our organizational mission as well. Um, and in as I'm rounding up, I was also asked to to really share, um, as I hope that I've uh, touched on before, is that uh, there really are. It's it's so key that. Um, we do not only see women as disproportionately impacted by the climate crisis, but actually the folks who are driving solutions and are on the front lines of resistance. Mm -hmm. This is something that in this space consistently bothers me is that I think folks um, tend to talk about the first section of that, but not necessarily the ways in which women are showing up as powerful drivers of change. Um, so in addition to a lot of the spaces that I've already discussed that women were advocating at um, powerfully and bravely and boldly, um, one space that I would direct folks to is the Gender Just Climate Solutions uh, packet, which we do did in in collaboration with other folks um, who are in the women and gender constituency to really highlight dozens of grassroots feminist and grassroots women solutions around the world that they are implementing in their own communities. Um, and these speak to water rights, land rights, um, natural resource governance. There really is a broad swath of incredible solutions and in the ways that women in their own communities are working towards them um, and would recommend that folks uh, go check those out. So all of those are locally led and locally driven. Um, and they also are really key in demonstrating the interlinkages between cross-cutting issues. So uh, one, one, only one example from um, the Gender Just Climate Solutions Awards in recent years uh, is Bungru in India, who um, I think are a fantastic example of the ways that um, that uh, training rural women climate leaders um, has really changed so many lives around how rainwater management technology and farmers crops um, are interrelated with, with really the right to food security, um, the right to economic security, and what are the ways that community driven solutions can work together to see the interlinkages across these pieces. Um, so you can read much more about Bungaroo in the Gender Just Climate Solutions um, report, as well as dozens of other examples. Um, and Osprey lifted up the, the defund line three fight. This is again, an indigenous women uh, led resistance to a key pipeline fight that is uh, in so-called Minnesota. Um, the GNU Collective is an indigenous grassroots women led um, community collective effort that is really driving a lot of this resistance. And so uh, I think when we talk about women's solutions to the climate crisis too, lifting up the ways in which uh, resistance and direct action is a part of that is also so key. Um, last year, there was a gathering of many different feminists and women's rights orgs from around the world who were working on climate justice frameworks in their own regions and spaces. Um, this is on WeDo's website as well. I would recommend that folks go check that out. Um, there's a lot to learn, particularly as different folks focus on different areas that gender and climate intersect in. Um, and lastly, I would just say that feminist movements broadly are, are building power and are a part of, they are driving the solutions that we need to see in policy spaces, um, across movements, um, and really are what give me hope. So this is just one march from back when we could be in community with each other and in space. Um, and I miss it dearly, but I hope that it, it is um, on the horizon soon as well. So I'll, I'll wrap up there and apologies if I, if I went on for a while. I hope that that was useful and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. That was that was a very thorough explanation of um, or a presentation of some of the issues that you and I had talked. Um, I think there was one question. Someone mentioned, "Why do you uh, um, why do you state gender justice in the, instead of gender equality?" Do you want to address that quickly? Yeah, so I think um, gender justice for us feels like a more encompassing term that thinks about the ways that um, that justice 
incorporates aspects of equity as well. There's a, a lot of conversation around the ways that equity and equality um, have slightly different connotations. And I think for us, gender justice feels like a more appropriate term that feels both future looking and also reparative. So what are the ways that historically there are harms that need to be addressed around the ways that gender injustice has been perpetrated um, that we can think about as part of equity as well. So gender justice feels to capture, feels, um, like for us, it captures sort of the, the time frame that we are understanding and that it's both reparative and forward looking um, and also captures implications around equity. Great, thank you. Um, two quest uh, questions. Um, uh, uh, you got involved with climate justice as a feminist uh, and really found their intersectionalities very early on as a young adult. Um, what, what, um, what, you know, um, thoughts do you have to offer for young women, uh, feminist young women, in terms of joining the uh, uh, the climate uh, crisis and and joining the movement as feminists? Yeah, no, thank you for that question. Um, I'm very proud to be a young feminist. I think I actually came into um, this space from the perspective of coming from the climate movement and. Um, and then realizing that a lot of the values that I held and a lot of the work that I considered critical um, was actually feminist work. Um, and I just didn't understand it as that until I had the language for it. Um, and in the climate movement, I think youth representation is, um, is really gaining a lot of power because folks realize that um, young folks have, have a particular set of, um, of ideas around what is at stake for their future. And so I think young people are really leading the charge in, in the climate movement because um, we know that young people are going to be the ones who are facing the crisis uh, in, in now, but also in a decade, in two decades, in three decades. Um, and so I think for me, the climate movement and the feminist movement are really critical places in which um, I'm excited to see so much attention being paid to what intergenerational justice looks like um, and really knowing that uh, it is so key and our movements will fail if we do not have people of all ages of all generations elders and youth working towards shared goals um, and that we all have stake in ensuring that there is a gender just climate just future for us to live in um, and I, I've been so excited about the ways that intergenerational justice over the last few years in the feminist movement and the climate movement has really been more talked about. Um, and I think that's a credit to both uh, youth activists and activists who have been in this movement for decades. Um, and as a young feminist, it's, it's my attitude that I'm always in a space to um, lead as a young person and also to learn as a young person and that I need to constantly sort of be in a space of, of soaking up the wisdom of those around me and also knowing that um, though I am younger, I have, I have a voice and I want to use it um, and would encourage all, all other folks, young and um, young and of all ages um, to, to have a similar attitude. That's great. Mara, again, I want to thank you um, for joining us today. The present your presentation was fantastic. I learned a lot, and um, I'm sure there are lots of questions for you. If someone wants to contact you, we will certainly send all the uh, contact information to all the participants here, and we will also send um, your uh, PowerPoint presentation to the participants so that folks will have this information. Um, thank you again. Um, and we will talk to you soon. Thank you. It was such an honor to be here with you all. Um, and I have, a, I, I found a lot of joy and a lot of strength in sharing space with you all and being in, in collective community. So keep up the good work and onward. <laughs> Thank you. Um, today, Women Deliver is releasing, uh, um, a new research project and, um, 
and they've done tremendous amount of work researching uh, the connection uh, on climate and sexual and reproductive health and rights, SRHR. And um, we are going to very briefly hear from uh, Divya Matthew uh, from Women Deliver to give us a very, very brief um, uh, introduction to your research project. And then you can tell us where folks can find uh, the data and um, um, this report. Um, Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> uh, good afternoon from New York. Um, as, as you said, my name is Divya Matthew and I'm the Senior Manager for Research and Policy and Advocacy at Women Deliver. And, um, you know, Mara set up this uh, brief presentation really well. Uh, you know, there's a lot of evidence on the connection of gender equality and uh, climate change, but we wanted to dig a little deeper um, into exploring the links between climate change and sexual and reproductive health and rights. And so we worked on two pieces of research and my colleague Darcy is putting the link um, on, on the chat box. Um, the first piece is explores what the evidence says uh, on uh, the linkages between climate change and gender equality. And it's essentially designed for decision makers, for climate advocates and gender equality advocates to understand the linkages between uh, these sectors as they develop effective policies and programs. Um, the second piece, we've partnered with the International, in, um, International Institute for Sustainable Development and looking at the extent to which uh, SRHR have been considered in national adaptation processes. And um, uh, we've also developed an interactive web page uh, just to showcase uh, summarizing these two pieces of work. So we really do encourage you to um to um have a look but essentially making the case that you know for any gender transformative climate action we must be uh, looking at these linkages between srhr and and climate thank you thank you very much i'm looking forward to um reviewing your report and thank you for joining us and offering us this information um, we, uh, there, are over, uh, uh, there are about 198 of us on this call, and I know everyone is doing incredibly uh, important work uh, in the communities, and uh, we wanted to give you an opportunity to break into smaller group, groups and have an opportunity to speak about your work and also listen to others um, so that there is some sharing of information. Um, so we are going to break you into smaller groups of about 10 uh, people per group. You're going to be broken into these small groups. And in your groups, we want you to talk about what did you hear uh, from uh, the presentation, from the answers that Osprey offered us, and also Mara. Uh, what did you hear? How did the information resonate with, with your work? And how is uh, what you heard, uh, how is climate crisis connected to the work that you do with women and girls on the grassroots level? And uh, the last question is, uh, where do you see hope? Where do you find hope? Uh, and so we're gonna ask you to go into small groups and um, divide the time among the number of participants that are in your group to make sure that every person gets equal time. We don't want one or two people to uh, monopolize the conversation. Please divide the time among you and then um, answer these three questions. How, what did you hear? How is this connected to your work? And where do you find hope? Um, so we're going to give you um, about 25 minutes in your groups. And when you come back, we will have closing remarks. So thank you so much. And Devin is going to do uh, your magic and put us all into smaller uh, breakout groups.
Ой, кому-то слышно.